to the Charter Oak International School in West Hartford. We are here, the League of Women Voters and the West Hartford Community Television, to have a forum for the Board of Education, uh, the race for the Board of Education for 2017. We are pleased to be able to bring you this nonpartisan voter service. This forum is coming to you live from the, from the Academy, the International Academy, and will be shown numerous times on WHC-TV preceding the November 7th election. It will also be available for streaming through the station's YouTube channel. We thank the campaigns for their cooperation and especially Prince, Principal Mellon and the town administrators for granting the use of this school. I'm Carol Mulready, I'm a member of the League of Women Voters and will serve as the moderator for this forum. The League of Women Voters is a nonprofit, non partisan political organization that works to encourage informed and active participation in government. I am joined this evening by, by Manuela Canales, who is a who will read and translate any questions received in Spanish from our live audience. She is uh, a 20 year resident of West Hartford. She works full time as a civil servant for a state agency. She is a founding member of the nonprofit Hello West Hartford, which involves the citizens of West Hartford who speak up to 70 languages, different languages in our town. So we are pleased to have her here. She grew up in Spain and I think is going to be just fine translating for us. The format for this election event will consist of audience generated question with each candidate having up to 90 seconds to respond to the question. A lottery was conducted to determine the order for candidate responses. And then we will continue in the round robin process. The audience has been asked not to applaud until the end of the question period in order to save time for questions and answers. Now to get us started, each candidate will have 60 seconds to introduce herself or himself to you. First, we welcome Rob Levine. Levine. Thank you, Rob. Should I, should I start Kristen here? Yeah. Okay. No, right here. You stay right here. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Rob Levine. I'm a Republican candidate for uh, Board of Ed this November. Um, basically, uh, I'm running because I, I want to help bring change to the town as far as the Board of Ed is concerned. Um, the majority uh, Democratic Party has been in control uh, of the Board of Ed and the Town Council um, for over a decade. And I would just like to read some brief statistics to you uh, instead of telling you about um, my past. <laughs> um, things to think about. Our student enrollment level has uh, dropped a little over 1% in the last uh, 11 years. Our budget has increased 51%. Uh, our per people cost has increased 53%. We have a 29% increase in personnel, a 54% increase uh, in teachers, and a 46% increase in personnel across all boards. Um, I think we need to ask ourselves if our enrollment is static and our town population is the same, uh, where is the money going to? All I care about is our students and then and the outcomes that they have that, that are gonna make it the best of their ability to be the best students they can be. I want the money to go to them. And I'm not sure that's happening anymore. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Lorna. Thank you. Good evening, Lorna Thomas Marcus. And first of all, I want to thank the League of Women Voters, the West Hartford Community Television, Charter Oak International Academy, and you viewers who are here in the audience as well as watching on television for being a part of this event. Uh, I have been a resident of West Hartford for over 17 years, and proud to say that. I certainly enjoy all that West Hartford has to offer in terms of the quality of life, but certainly the quality of the excellent education system that we have. And I'm a parent as well, so that even bodes even more of a reason why I'm proud of the school system that we have. I am the proud mother of two daughters, both of whom are daughters here, rather students here at Charter Oak International Academy. Juliana, fourth grade, and Gabrielle, first grade, they're here, so thank you for supporting mommy. Um, and because our quality education is important, it's important for our kids to not only do well academically, but also socially and emotionally. That is a piece that I really want to recognize and support with all of our students, all of our children. As a town, we can do that collectively. Thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to engaging with you this evening. Thank you. Next, we have Jay Sarvin. 
Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Hi, I'm Jay Sarzen. I'm an incumbent Republican on the Board of Education, and I'm running for re-election, and I want to say up front how excited I am to be here this evening in front of the citizens of West Hartford uh, and on television tonight. Hopefully people are uh, able to catch this from the safety and comfort of their homes. Um, my primary reason for running is pretty simple. Uh, in my five years on the board, I have seen our budgets increase exponentially, and that simply is not a sustainable trajectory. We, last year, went through a what I like to call a root canal and dove into a lot of different budget items, and we considered whether or not we wanted to keep them in the budget. And unfortunately, we decided to keep a lot of them in the budget, and I begged our majority to not go down that path, and instead they chose to ignore that advice, and we are now facing a real train wreck coming with the state budget. I can't say this enough. Change has to come to West Harbor, and if you want change, then you need to vote for me and for Rob Levine as change agents for this Board of Education. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Next, we have Cheryl Greenberg. Hi, I'm Cheryl Greenberg. I'm current chair of the Board of Ed. Uh, I teach African American history at Trinity College. I've also taught in China. I've taught in Finland. I teach in a Connecticut prison, and I taught in a New York high school. So I think all the time about how to teach critical thinking and creative thinking uh, and respectful dialogue. I'm also the parent of two children who went through the West Hartford Public Schools, as well as the Finnish and Chinese schools, and I know how important quality teaching and an inclusive and rigorous curriculum and child-centered learning are. And as a parent of children who did not know how to speak Finnish or Chinese when they first arrived, I know how critical effective ESOL programs are. Our glory in our town is our diversity. We speak 73 languages. We are diverse racially, ethnically, economically. Uh, we have children with different learning styles, with intellectual and different physical and emotional needs. And all this enriches our town. But it also means that we have a number of uh, programs that we have to make sure are available to everybody. We all love our schools. We all love our town. Uh, but the current budget is making it very difficult. Uh, so if I'm re-elected, I promise to look for more savings and more uh, effective funding sources, but I also promise to keep the fighting, to keep fighting, to keep the cuts out of the classrooms, uh, and to preserve the core mission of our, co of our uh, schools to protect all, this, and all the students here. Thank you. And next we have Deb Poland. Good evening. My name is Deb Poland, and I'm seeking your support for the Board of Education. I'm really pleased to be here tonight at this forum organized by the League, West Hartford Community Television, and asked for by the, the residents of West Hartford so we can talk together tonight about how to preserve our schools as one of our town's greatest assets. My husband, Ian, and I moved here about 18 years ago. We have raised two kids, we're still raising two kids here in town uh, that went through Aiken, King Phillip, and Hall High School. Our son, Jordan, is a sophomore now at University at Albany and our daughter is a junior at Hall. Um, I have about 19 years of experience working in public policy, both at the state capitol and for a nonprofit, and I'd like to bring that experience with me to the important issues that are discussed at the level of the Board of Education in town. I've been active in our community as a member of a variety of different boards, and now I'm hoping to represent you on the Board of Education. Thank you for your support. Thank you very much, all. And uh, for our first question, which will go first to Robert Bean and then down the line, this was done by lottery. There are thousands of students across the country who are currently storm refugees in need of an education home. Would you support bringing students to West Hartford should we be called upon? And we're going to translate that. Hay miles de estudiantes en este país que en estos momentos son refugiados de la tormenta en necesidad de encontrar un hogar para su educación. ¿Usted apoyaría traer esos estudiantes a West Hartford si nos piden hacerlo? Thank you, Rob. Okay, I also want to mention real quick, thanks for the question. Um, I also want to thank the um, West Harper Education Association. I received their endorsement this year uh, for the election, so I just want to say a quick thank you to them. Uh, and also, one minute's hard to get everything in. Uh, my wife is a teacher in town for 17 years, and I have three school age children as well. Um, regarding the question, I, uh, my heart goes out to the, those folks. Uh, obviously, everyone deserves to have a fair 
and a good education, regardless of where they are. Um, and I think it's a wonderful idea to welcome them to our community if, if we have um, the space for them. And I, I would also always say that we have to look at things uh, from, from a budget standpoint as well. We have to be compassionate, uh, and, I, and I, I think that's foremost important, but we also have to be considerate of the delicate budget situation that we are in. And without knowing uh, at this time, as far as I know, what if any money we're getting from the state, uh, budget-wise, you know, I, I, I can't just say uh, blatantly without knowing the financial impact that we should just say yes, this is something we should do. Um, on the merits of it, simply speaking, socially, yes, absolutely we want to help out kids, always support children getting education, but we have to keep in mind that West Hartford is in crisis and that it is not going to get better. Uh, for far too long we have just tried to be everything to everyone, and we can't continue to do that. We have to be measured in our response as far as how we do things budgetarily, and that's what we have to do going forward. Thank you. Lauren will be next. Lauren. To follow with that question, what would like it repeated? No, no, same sorry. question. Same you, question. Okay, great. Thank you. Same question, yes. So I, I respect what you have shared. I think certainly when it comes to uh, considering whether or not to house persons that have, un due to unforeseen circumstances, no longer have housing and are no longer able to receive um, education, I think that it is important to recognize we're talking about human beings. And for that reason, my initial response is, let's see what we can do to try to support human beings, to try to support children. I think there's a difference between crisis intervention and maintenance. It's one thing if we're talking about housing persons for a long extended period of time, but if we're talking about an immediate crisis intervention to help persons that are in need on an immediate level, to help try to uh, reclaim their safety and in terms of housing, in terms of food, in terms of clothing, in terms of education, which all children should be afforded the opportunity to do. I think that as much as West Hartford would speak of how proud we are of our town, how we service so many persons, we're proud of our diversity, we're proud of our quality education, but there comes a time where we must practice what we preach. So I think for that reason, certainly have more discussion, but I think the discussion should be along the lines of what can we do? How can we support others? Because I'm certainly sure if something were to happen to us as a larger community on that same realm, we would want others to support us as well. Jay, would you like to? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll weigh in. Um, I look at this as, as an a issue of capacity. Um, we certainly have the space here in West Hartford uh, for these children if they were to come. We are well along the path of having open choice seats. The difference is that for open choice, we at least get reimbursed for those. Um, we don't know how many kids, and we certainly don't know what sort of needs that they would have, and therefore it'd be very difficult to assess the impact on our district. I think we would have to be able to do that before we can speak intelligently about it. I mean, I, I can sit here and, 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 and gush tears and joys and unicorns and rainbows and say, yes, by all means, we ought to bring these people in because I think that's instinctive. You know, we all want to help people. But I think the bottom line is that we have to be very uh, smart about how to do this if, if we're even coming to our doorstep. At this point, I'm not sure that it has. But if it does, I think we need to take a very measured approach, assess the needs of these kids coming in, make sure that we can accommodate them because you know there are other districts in the state who might be able to handle them. Uh, it doesn't always have to fall on the shoulders of West Hartford. Uh, we are a diverse community. We are very proud of that. But just because we are a diverse community doesn't mean that we have to shoulder all the burdens of the world. There have to be there has to be some shared um, sharing of um, burdens um, with others and. I would say that would be the approach that I would take with regard to those kids coming to Puerto Rico and elsewhere. Thank you. Cheryl, would you like to comment? Uh, yes, um, I appreciate all those views, but it seems to me that there is one clear answer, and that is that every child who lives in West Hartford for how, however long is a child in West Hartford and gets education. That's just how it is. We have homeless children in West Hartford, they get ed education. If there are children who come from Puerto Rico and live in West Hartford, even if it's for a week, even if it's with a family member or a friend, they get education because they're in West Hartford. That's just, that's how we do it. And uh, as, as uh, the superintendent said, every child in West Hartford gets an education. And so even if it costs us a lot, and that would be a real problem, I, I admit, um, we don't have any choice. We educate every child who lives in our, in our town, no matter how long they live here. Poland? 
I want to associate my remarks with Cheryl's and just add that not only do we want to accept any students into our town who are moving here from any other place, but we also want to make sure that the families are connected to the services that they need to help them make a home here. Even if it's not short term, let's have them come forever if they want to make West Hartford their home. I think that people will find West Hartford to be a very welcoming community. I think that many uh, people from Puerto Rico do have a lot of family members in this area. Let's have them come here and make them feel welcome as they should. Can I, can I rebut or you say something? <laughs> yeah, 30 seconds. Um, I don't know if I misunderstood the question. I mean, obviously if they're here, then we, we should educate them. But it was my understanding is should we, should we tell them to come here or should we advocate for them to come here? Because um, I agree, once they're here, that's our responsibility. And this is, again, goes to the all things to all people. We simply can't afford it. So we can try to say that it's a great idea, that it's the right thing to do, and I don't disagree with it. And I think if we had an endless pot of money, uh, then we would certainly say, bring them all in. But that's the thinking that needs to change. We can't be everything to everyone, and we have to start budgeting in a way that we're going to be serious about that. Thank you all. The uh, next question will go first to Lorna. How do you envision handling declining school enrollment over the coming years? My first response is wanting to explore why is that the case. I think that certainly means connecting with persons in the community or persons who may formerly were in the community and no longer, try to get a sense of why are they no longer here, why is the involvement declining. I think that sometimes those things can happen by natural occurrence, whether it be a splurge of new births or maybe a splurge of people who graduated and gone on to college. I think it more so it requires us to get more answers before I can just give a candid answer to that. But I think it's something for us not to minimize the importance of it. If we continue to see a steady decline over time, that certainly is something for us to address because we know that young people soon will be our leaders of tomorrow. So if the population of young persons continues to decline, well, that's going to impact all of us in the long run. So I think certainly having more discussion, trying to get a sense of why is the enrollment declining, uh, and then once we have more insight into that, trying to address how can we respond to it in a proactive way, where we're not going to be having a conversation 10, 20, 30 years from now saying, uh-oh, who is going to lead us uh, tomorrow? Jay, can I Yes, thank you. So, I mean, I, I'm all about drilling and root causes, but I can probably think of several reasons why we might see declining enrollment in this poor economy that we've been experiencing for the past eight years or so. Uh, I definitely think that there has been a sense that West Hartford has become expensive for people. That's just some hypotheses, so I'm just throwing them out there. But as far as what we do about them once you're here, I think it's pretty apparent. You have a, what I like to call a peanut butter decline across the district. There isn't one decline in any one specific school. So it's not as though we're going to look at one school and say, aha, we're going to be able to shut that one down. I think with the decline in enrollment that's spread evenly across the district, you're going to see gradual decreases in class sizes. And hopefully, um, what we just saw this past uh, week at the last Board of Education meeting where Tom Moore, uh, or actually Chip Ward presented that our numbers declined, but not as precipitously as originally thought. Hopefully, we'll see a little bit of an arrest in that decline, and hopefully we won't have to go down a path of uh, increasing class sizes or shutting down school. Um, those are things that nobody wants to hear, and I can imagine people's guts churning right now, and I'm with you on that. I'm not a fan of that either, but I think that when you look at the economics of it, and you consider what this district is paying, and the number of students and teachers it has to support, I think it's only a fair question that if enrollment's declined at that point, it has to be a conversation that the district has to have. Thank you. Ms. Greenberg? I know it will come as a surprise to partisans, but I actually completely agree with Jay. Um, I do. Uh, if families with kids, have to, the number of families with kids have declined across Connecticut, uh, and they declined in West Hartford, I think, partly because the cost of living is high both in Connecticut and in West Hartford. I think we do have to address that in general. Um, but we've seen this for years. The, um, the administration has been addressing this. We have, they have charts. They have figured this out all the way through, uh, through the years. And so, for example, last year we were, allowed, we were able to shrink um, the faculty and the um, 
and the student body in general, just because of regular declining enrollments. So part of this is actually a savings, and we're, we're buying into that. The other option, of course, is to increase um, room for open choice and other uh, partner programs. And we're, we're looking into that, too. So yeah, if there's a dramatic change in one particular place, we're going to see it. Otherwise, we're going to see smaller classes, perhaps fewer classes per grade, uh, and maybe more other kinds of students as, as time goes by. Thank you. Dan Coleman? Sure, I'll just add that I think it's important to look at enrollment on the long term and not just one year over the next, but maybe every five years or so to examine enrollment trends. Uh, we know that um, during a recession, people have fewer children, and so that's what we're seeing now, that from the recession from 2008, uh, we have uh, fewer babies were born over the, those couple of years. And uh, that is completely normal. Uh, we see a lot of peaks and valleys with births if you look across all of the data sets. In the past, uh, West Hartford uh, was not as thoughtful as they possibly could have been when they saw a declining enrollment. And um, they actually closed a school, which I think was later um, regretted by some people. So we want to make sure that whatever is done is done in a very thoughtful, planful way, looking not just at the next couple of years, but at the long term. Thank you. Mr. Well, I don't think we have to think about this as a future thing because it's happening right now. Uh, we're seeing declining over right now. We need to be thinking right now for what's going on. The reason this is happening, I disagree. I don't, I don't know so much that it's in the number of kids people are having. West Hartford is no longer affordable. Let that sink in. West Hartford is no longer affordable. I'm a real estate broker in town. I hear it all the time. Taxes are off the charts. Um, fees, expenses, you know, pay to play. Everything is going up, up, up. So people aren't going to want to stay in town. It isn't so much that it's kind of because of those kind of things. It's just they're going to other places, folks. We've got to get the affordability, and we have to get the budget under control. It's out of control. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to start our next question in Spanish. Por favor, describa cómo enfoca su trabajo como miembro de la Junta Educativa. ¿Cómo ve su relación laboral entre la Junta Educativa el Consejo de la Ciudad y el Público. ¿Cómo recoge información a quien consulta? ¿Cómo interactúa con los miembros de la Junta? Please describe your approach to your work as a member of the Board of Education. How do you view the working relationship between the Board of Education the town council and the public. How will you gather information? Who will you consult? How will you interact with the board members? This question goes to Jay Sarson first. It's a, a multi-part question. Well, let's um, let's stipulate first that it's really not work. It's it's, it's a volunteer effort. Um, work implies that you get paid for this, and I assure you all that we do not get paid for this. Um, but as far as how we approach our working relationship with the town council, uh, I think that our relationship with the town council is fairly strong. Uh, I think that for the most part, we are in basic agreement on broad issues, but I still think that there are some areas of disagreement that we've had with the, with the town council. Um, uh, last year, if you all recall, the town council asked the Board of Education to excise an additional $300,000 from our budget cuts, and that was a direct reflection of our inability, in their minds, of, of as a board of education, to come in terms with the economic reality. Even they said you've got to get another 300000 out. But I still think that, by and large, the relationships are good. Um, there really isn't a bone of contention as there is in some towns. Um, I know that the administrations work very well together um, between Tom Moore and um, and um, Mark, uh, Matt Hart, the new man I keep thinking about in the I'm assuming that the relationship will be good. But what were the other parts of the question? I kind of lost it. Um, how will you gather information? Who will you consult? I think you answered. Right, yeah, I, I, I think that we all know where to go to. Chip Ward is pretty central. Um, Chip serves both masters pretty well. And if we need information, we can go to Chip Ward. Thank you. Ms. Greenberg? I hate to sound boring, but I agree with Jim. Um, 
I, I will add a couple of things, though. The Board of Education does not have a budget. We ask for money, and the council gives it to us. Where we agree, and I think Jay's absolutely right, is that they prioritize education. We obviously prioritize education. And so we, we work very well in that, on that, in that sense, unlike many towns where there's a lot of pressure from the town council to cut um, education funding. The other thing that I want to say um, is how we work on, on the board, and at least in my experience. There are certainly divisions among board members. Sometimes that's partisan. Sometimes, actually, it's male versus female. Sometimes it's random. It's really quite bizarre. But my point is that we are not, by and large, operating as a partisan body. And we work very hard, I think, to find mutual solutions. And that's partly because we actually all agree that the schools really are a priority. And while we may differ on one particular program or something like, or something else, it's really something within a framework of agreement. The third thing I just want to say is that the um, Board of Education does not have as much power as people think it does. We can ask for a budget, but we don't necessarily get it. We can hire and fire the, the superintendent, but we can't, for example, get involved in school policies uh, directly or curriculum or something like that. So we are an advisory board in some sense, and I think we all take it very seriously and work very hard together uh, to move forward. Okay, How would I approach my work on the Board of Ed is how I approach everything in my life, and that is I'm a collegial person, I think creatively, I'm pragmatic, so I like to think about um, what might actually work, but that doesn't mean that I don't have a vision for things as well. I just, um, I don't have a problem taking smaller steps if that's what's needed in, in, in order to get there. But I want to spend my time on this question talking about the piece regarding um, engaging the public and town council in the work of the board. I'm really excited about the idea of civic engagement. And those of you who came out tonight, I appreciate your being here. And those of you who are watching um, live or later on, I appreciate your watching. Because getting the input of the people who live in this town is the most important part of the work of the Board of Education. Uh, one thing I'd like to do is I'd like to have Board of Ed meetings rotate around so they're not always at town council, but they're where people feel comfortable going. We could have a Board of Ed meeting right here in this auditorium at Turner Oak or in any of the other schools in town. And people might feel more comfortable coming because it's where they already feel at home every single day. I'd like to have roundtable discussions about certain programs, not just at budget time when we're talking about which programs to save and which ones to cut, but all the time. That's one of the ways that I would like to involve the public in the work of the Board of Education. Thank you, Mr. Levine. Um, I would look forward to working with everyone on the board, you know, collegially. Um, one way I'd be different is um, going into the schools. I have three school, school children in there already. Uh, the wife is a teacher, so I hear plenty of just not going anywhere, just being home um, about what's going on in the schools. But, uh, I would, I would like to do more reach out. I mean, obviously, talking to administration, the superintendent uh, is key. But uh, I, I do think it, it helps to kind of get out on the front lines and talk to the people that actually are, are doing the job and that are, are there day in and day out. And then you know, bringing that information back and sharing it with the board uh, as a whole. Uh, I think the more information we get um, from the people actually doing the jobs will really help translate into not only the type of uh, programs and policies that should the board should be either advocating or supporting, um, but also getting back to the findings of well, how are we getting the best um, bang for the buck for our money? Because um, sometimes I think we can maybe get too far removed when we're just sitting in a budget room um, with you know, administration and management people versus actually talking to teachers on the ground and like, yeah, you know, this math intervention or this reading program really made a difference, and if we could do a little bit more of that, that would really make an impact on our, on our student outcomes. Because for me, it's all about student outcomes. Uh, I'd much rather see that money go right into the school and look at, again, how we could potentially cut back on money that's been spent administratively or in these garage rules. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, way that I plan and hope to have the opportunity to interact and engage, I very much firmly believe in open lines of communication. And I think it's first important to maintain open lines of communication within the board itself. If there is a gap in communication or, or ineffective communication, then the board, well, that's going to translate into how we interact with the population and community at large. 
I am someone who is very big on being honest. I too many times tell persons how I like to keep it real. Even though there may be a time I may say something you don't like or you may not want to hear, it comes from a good place. And that's where I feel we need to interact with each other, knowing that we are here representing the town. We're not here just for our own agenda. We are here to be the voice for the children here, to be a voice for the parents here. And this goes to the second piece. I think that's where it's important for us to know we must interact with everyone who is here. All of the families, all of the parents. I very much believe that it takes a village to raise a child. So it's not just about thinking linearly. You have to think at a more community-based level. That means hearing what your thoughts are, hearing what your concerns are. If, I, if we think that is something that we should move forward with, well, so be it. But if it's something that we need to take a different direction, at least your voice was heard. It very much is important for everyone's voice to be heard. So being a part of the board, I think, means you must lead by example. So if we're going to ask for our young people to learn a certain way in school or to exemplify certain behaviors, well, we must practice that ourselves. Even with us being here tonight, someone may say something that I may not really agree with. I'm going to respectfully listen and then respond. We teach others by modeling. I, I just want to follow up with all this and let everyone know that you know the focus of the question for me was between us and town council, but certainly among the board. Um, most of you probably don't know this, but um, Mark Zanowitz and I, the other Republican on the board of Ed, and Mark Obermeyer and Velasquez, we get together about eh, what, every eight weeks or so and just to talk board business, and we all listen to one another. Um, I think that's important and. We're anticipating that Cheryl, Cheryl's more of a pancake fan, so we'll have pancakes with Cheryl as, as we go along. But the key is, is that we all do speak to one another on a variety of issues as we go along. All right, thank you. Um, for this next question, we're going to have it asked in, we're going to ask it in English and in Spanish, and there will be a summary of the response of each candidate immediately after that candidate speaks gives his answer or her answer in English. Okay. How do you want to address the achievement gap in this district? How do you want to address the achievement gap in this district? This question goes first to Cheryl Greenberg. Thanks. Uh, First of all, there are two kinds of achievement gaps. Just to be clear, the state identifies achievement gaps as gaps between uh, students with special needs, uh, low income, free to uh, lunch students, uh, and oh, English as a second, as a uh, speakers of uh, English as speakers of second of other languages. Uh, and those achievement gaps are real, uh, and that's one set of challenges. The other achievement gap, which is the one that we often talk about as the board too, is differences between, say, white and African-American and Hispanic uh, children. And both of those are real gaps and they really need to be addressed. Um, and so far, the curriculum has been, uh, we have scrutinized every aspect of the curriculum, not the board, but I mean the administration under, uh, with our help. Every, every aspect of the curriculum to make sure that it is inclusive in all sorts of ways, that it engages different people we have tried uh, different kinds of interventions to suit different learning styles, different backgrounds. Um, we have worked on uh, diversity among our teachers and our, uh, and our staff in order to bring these things together uh, and create a diverse place for these uh, kids to learn in. And in fact, we've started to see some small declines in the gap. They're still too large, any gap is too large, but we are trying to address it on as many different levels as we can. Thank you, Carol. Hay dos tipos diferentes de diferentes en el progreso. Uno se reconoce el Estado y los estudiantes son parte de los específicos. El segundo es eh, la diferencia entre grupos de diferente raza y de eh, grupos culturales. Y la Junta Educativa ha analizado el currículum para asegurar de que recoge la diversidad. The achievement gap is a tough nut to crack. This is an area where we've made um, slow but steady progress, but um, not quickly enough, in my opinion. There is no reason that children should not be learning and performing at the same potential, regardless of the color of their skin, 
for the background and their homes, their family situation. And that's where our town needs to come together, uh, both on the school side of things and town programs and programs run by social services agencies. I believe in educational equity, and that means that we need to provide the opportunities, the support, and the tools that students need in order to reach their potential. What that looks like for one person is going to be different than what that looks like for somebody else. And our teachers do a phenomenal job of identifying where those gaps are in people's home lives, in the technology that they have. Uh, we actually have a laptop owner program at the high schools. Many people don't realize that. But I think it's very important to consider what people have in their homes for support, whether that's um, people support in their families or uh, resources and to try to meet those needs and using as many resources as we can, whether they are public resources or through nonprofits operating in our town. Thank you. Translation. Está ciudad está definitivamente progresando, pero no lo suficiente. Y no hay ningún motivo para que estudiantes de diferentes grupos no puedan conseguir en su máximo desarrollo. La igualdad es muy importante y destacamos que los maestros del distrito hacen un trabajo fenomenal. Por ejemplo, eh, reconociendo las diferentes necesidades cuando se trata de los medios tecnológicos. My thoughts on the achievement gap are, uh, I don't have the answer, <laughs> um, but I, I would expect that we would think that any of us do. Um, what I would like to do differently is, again, you know, I'm just a big teacher fan, I guess, but I, I would go directly to the teachers and say, you know, what do you need? Um, again, I think those are the frontline people we need to talk to based on the conversations I've already had. Like, they're the ones that are dealing with this day in and day out. So if we really want to understand like what's working well, what's not working well, we need to talk to them. Um, I think it's, you know, it's always good to get an overview uh, of working with our uh, superintendents and superintendents on this subject. But uh, again, you know, teachers are the ones that you know, they're smart. They know what's going on out there. They're already working as hard as they can to close that achievement gap. Um, I, I don't want to put any more burdens on them. What I would like to see us do is, like I said, talk to them and see what things they need. Again, like what I kind of referenced earlier is looking for that you know, program evaluation, that cost-benefit analysis. That's what we need to be doing more of as far as you know, how we're spending our town's dollars to best serve the student population. Talk to the teachers, look at the programs in place, figure out the ones that we need to expand based on the ones that are working, do away with the ones that aren't, and then go from there. That's what I would do. I think that, first of all, it's a good thing that we recognize. Oh, I apologize. Excuse me. I have a question definitive. What we need to do is talk to the teachers, ask them what they need, and see if it's working for them, so that we can reduce the progress of the progress. It's necessary to have a conversation with the superintendent, but definitely to evaluate the programs I think in regards to the achievement gap, we certainly recognize that it is here. But I also believe it's really important for us to think of how we conceptualize or what our mindset is in regard to addressing it. I really believe it's important for us to know that all children have the potential to learn. And I think in regard to how students learn, there isn't always a cookie-cutter approach for it. There's something called multiple intelligences. It's getting a lot of more research and studies now that shows that there are different ways of evaluating someone's intellect. It's not always just based on a particular number. So in part, yes, I do think it is helpful to talk to the teachers who I respectfully disagree. I don't think that it's a burden on our teachers. I think that's what makes our town so wonderful is our teachers are so invested in helping to educate our young people. The times that they spend with our kids, not only on the clock, but also after hours, coming to after school programs and meeting the children at their level, not just teaching at them, but teaching with them. That's important. But I also think it's important in touching base with young people to find out what works well for you. Some people may work, learn better through learning, through rather listening. 
some may be more visual learners. So it's a combination of talking certainly with the teaching staff to see what their suggestions are in addressing challenges with the student population, those that may be falling behind, but also touching base with a young person and asking them, well, what works best for you? How are you better able to learn? How can I work with you? You want to meet a young person where they are and then from there help to bring them up because it's important for every person, every child to have the potential to learn and we support that. Tenemos el enfoque de las inteligencias múltiples. Es necesario, desde luego, hablar con los maestros, que siempre hacen algo más de lo que se les pide, pero no olvidemos preguntarles a los estudiantes y que ellos nos digan qué es lo que mejor funciona para ellos. Thank you. I'm not sure how much more insight I can add to this that my five um, panelists here have added. Um, I will say that I think that a lot of the achievement gap can be eradicated through careful deployment of ESOL. I think a command of the English language definitely can mitigate many of the problems, not all, but many of the problems that we see in our schools. But I, I do want to kind of step back a little bit and, and think about what we're all talking about here. And you know, we're, we're talking about closing an achievement gap. And you know, when, when I hear that, I, I think to myself, well, we can deploy as many resources uh, as we can. And it may be that sometimes, somehow, um, we're not going to get the outcome that we think. Um, there are an awful lot of variables at play here with our, our children, and we have to do everything we can as a district to maximize their potential. We have to give them every opportunity to succeed and maybe even exceed expectations. But sometimes I get nervous that we're placing an unfair burden in all due respect. I think we may be placing an unfair burden on our teachers by expecting them to close an achievement gap that may not be completely closable for all kids due to a variety of circumstances. We should all expect equal opportunity, we should get people to maximize their potential, but I think it would be foolish necessarily for us to assume that we are all going to have equal outcomes. Can I just uh, answer the question? Ms. Graver? Uh, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Carol's lady. Tenemos que tener en cuenta que los grupos de estudiantes que están aprendiendo inglés eh, es parte de es un grupo definitivamente relevante para cerrar que sea diferente al progreso. Y el distrito, desde luego, tiene que dar la oportunidad a todos los estudiantes para que consigan eh, desarrollar todo su potencial, pero debemos ser realistas y no se le puede exigir a los maestros y los dos son todo. Okay. All right, Mr. Weber. Sorry. Uh, thanks. I just want to say that uh, while we don't know all the causes, one thing that we did learn uh, last time, last, at the last board meeting, is that much of the achievement gap is actually thanks, is actually due to how much time children spend in the West Arctic schools. And, uh, so if you came recently, the achievement gap is actually larger. The more time that a child has spent in the West Hartford schools, the smaller the gap. And I just think it's important to say that already we are doing tremendous things in West Hartford if we are closing the gap with long-term students. Mr. Levine. I just want to clarify my burdensome comment. I, and my point is that um, I don't think as a board or anyone else should, should uh, lord over teachers. They already know what what is working and what isn't working in the classroom. So they're working daily already to, to close that achievement gap. And I'm, I'm loath to sit up here and suggest a new curricula or, or something that they should be doing um, from our perspective, unless it's been fully vetted by the teachers themselves. Because they've already got a full plate. Like I said before, they know what they're doing. And I just want to let them do their job. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, I'd like to offer the opportunity for anyone in the audience to come to the microphone to ask a question. And if you have brought up a question, I'm happy to give it to you and you can ask it at the microphone. 
I brought one. handwriting. That was a good idea. Um, I was just wondering how you will support or even advocate for the improvement of environmental awareness in our schools. Keep in mind, many of these changes bring much needed cost savings, like reusable utensils, composting, taking food waste out of our cafeterias, out of the trash, and um, sending it to a facility where it, they can make use of the food waste. Um, we can encourage children to grow their own food. That's an easier way to get food into the cafeteria, make improvements to the nutrition of meals. I spend a lot of time in the cafeteria, and I would love, I would welcome anyone to come with me. And, and there's actually, there's so many prongs to this issue that you can learn about um, in the cafeteria. So thank you. How would you support or even advocate for the improvement of environmental programs and awareness in our schools? Honestly, something that I've thought that much about, but I really appreciate hearing those ideas. Um, I know from my own children's experience that there are some schools in town that have started gardens of their own that are doing some work with um, re recycling food or food waste. Um, I'd, I'd really love to do more with that, including um, getting the science teachers involved and promoting environmental awareness and education um, to students at all levels. I think that's a great project for our schools to work on, uh, maybe even from the ground up, if it were, uh, through parent involvement, uh, the PTOs, and any collaboration we can have with existing resources in the community. So thank you very much for bringing that idea forward. Uh, again, thank you. I think it's a great question, and I, I would be a big proponent of this, because I'm all about environmental, especially when it can lead to cost savings. Um, I think a lot of things you're referring to would do exact that, exactly that. And um, there are things already going on in the schools too, so uh, I would love to see them do something in the uh, cafeteria to uh, help with acoustics because I usually leave there when you hear me. Um, but in, in all seriousness, I, like the garden stuff that's going on, my son just went on a two day field trip to um, Winding Trails where they did all types of things outside environmental. I mean, there were a lot of games and things with team building. Um, so I think there's a lot of things that go on. Um, I've heard other people mention it in the past, and I think it's a great idea looking at like solar panel, panels on the roof of buildings um, to help reduce our electric output. Um, many of the ideas that you think are, uh, bring up are great ideas, so I would be, someone would be an advocate for you to, to I, I love the idea of having people from the community doing exactly this. Coming up, there's any idea that maybe we aren't uh, proposing on our own, and then letting us run with it as your representatives. I think that's kind of the job that we have is being true public servants. So then it's just getting a majority agreement here to say, yeah, this sounds like some good stuff. Obviously, we need to do the research to see how we could possibly implement it, what the potential cost savings or costs would be. But um, either way, looking at it and seeing like, how we can plan on that. I love the idea. Okay. Laura. I as well am very much in support of the idea. And I think it's important when we have new ideas to not just put them on the table, but then find a way to execute the plans. I can say here at Charter Oak International Academy, there is a group called Deep Roots that certainly speaks on that accord. Uh, they recently have made several changes within the inside of the building and also the outside of the building. In the cafeteria, we no longer have plastic utensils. We have uh, metal utensils now. There's a compost that happens throughout the school. We have a garden as well. If you want to go get some fresh tomatoes, they're very tasty, you can go and pick them up as well. So I think, and that also has been done by the leadership of a parent here at Charter Oak. So I think it's important when you do that, to speak of ideas, it's also important to have someone who can help to carry through and follow through those ideas. And we all benefit from that. In regard to cost savings, it certainly saves money. When you can go pick your own vegetables versus going to the grocery store, you're saving money. And it's also helping us in terms of nutritional value as well, and helping us in the long term as well, because we have to take care of our planet, we have to take care of our home. So I think that's an excellent question. I very much would be in support of that, and would encourage others to do the same. Uh, Jay? Sure. Um, this question is sort of like, Jay, are you, are you in favor of safe bridges? Why, why yes I am, as a matter of fact. I, I enjoy safety as I travel. Um, and I certainly don't want to do anything that would harm the environment. Um, and if there is a added 
benefit to it as far as our savings, then I'm, I become even more in favor of it. Um, what I will say is that when efforts like this have bubbled up, um, and I'll point to 2013, the Growing Great Schools Initiative, um, you know, I worked with those folks to get a healthier chicken into the public schools, and we allocated extra money to it, and that was all well and good. Um, but there's not enough evidence there to necessarily say that uh, the needle has moved as far as uh, lunch consumption. So that would be a situation where I'd say, well, let's let it ride for a little bit, let's see if we can market it a little bit better. But if there's, you know, a net cost to the school system, then I think you need to shut it down. So I'm all in favor of, you know, testing out new ideas, new utensils and plates and all that. But if we run into it and we see that it's, you know, there's a net cost, and the environmental benefit is not that great, then I think you've got to take a little bit of a, a deeper look at that. But just conceptually speaking, I think it's a good question. I think it's something that we can all probably benefit from. Thank you, Carol. Uh, I second everybody's enthusiasm, of course. Uh, but I just want to say, in addition to parents' involvement, particularly in elementary school, we also have kids' own involvement. I know that when my girls were in the hall, there was the, the program about reusable water bottles and providing um, water coolers or something like that to refill your bottles so that they can, you should have to keep buying um, plastic bottles of water so that kids when they're older can themselves also get involved in these things. And I think it's important to support them as well as, of course, the parents. And I think the other advantage of that, which I'm sure everybody agrees but people haven't mentioned, is that if we raise awareness in our kids of the importance of the environment, then they will carry that into adulthood. So it's not just a question of making charter of a green building, which we did, or looking for immediate savings, all of which is true, or better nutrition, but also that we're teaching them the importance of that going forward when they become adults. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I just, you know, Sherry sure, raised a great point about the, the refilling of the bottles, but that's a situation where you have to really look at the costs and the benefits of that. Um, Obviously, there's the cost of the water flowing through our pipes, and there's the added cost of when, back in the day, Chip Ward said, we, the district would make money hand over fist selling bottled water. Now, I get it. Uh, the more bottled water you sell, the more bottles there are to clog up our landfills and our recycling bins. I, I get that. But I think that's a problem that you have to acknowledge and recognize that there could be a, um, a law of unintended consequences. Um, our time is starting to grow short, and we have quite a few questions. I'm asking the panel if it would be willing to do your response in one minute for the questions that we have remaining, so that we can get two or three questions more, okay? Um, and if you, okay, we have a person to come to the microphone. Hello, um, I'm an open choice parent, and I wanted to speak, um, basically, my kid, I've been an open choice parent for many years, and my kids have dealt with uh, adversity and discrimination here in the district, um, not only because they're um, children of color, but also because they're coming in from Hartford. How do you plan on helping create more inclusion for our students? Thank you for the question. Um, again, my, my first reaction is to reach out to directly to schools. Um, I, I think it's unfortunate. That I know there are programs already in place, like anti-bullying programs, if you see something, say something, those kind of things. Um, but obviously there's always many things that fall within the cracks, um, which is not tolerable to me. So I, I think that's a discussion that we need to have at the, at the local school level, individually within schools, and with uh, principals, teachers, uh, guidance counselors, maybe put together some sort of uh, group, task force, uh, and say, you know, what can we do to address the, these ongoing issues? Because obviously if it happens even one kid, it's not acceptable. Um, I, I, I've dealt with it in my past. I'm a, a father of child special needs. And um, I, 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 to me, literally zero tolerance policy for me that happened in our district. So um, unfortunately, it's something that's difficult to completely eradicate. Um, but I think we need to stay on top of it by doing everything we can to keep in touch with everyone at the local level Thank you. Ms. Parkerson? I do thank you for your, your question. I think your question addresses something that's quite real. 
Uh, you're referring to yourself as an open choice parent. I'm a parent who resides here in this town, and I have had similar experiences as what you're talking about. So I think the reality is those types of issues do happen. So yes, the conversation can happen within the schools, but we also need to recognize the conversations need to happen at home. Children are not born with certain mentalities of talking about someone because of how they look. You learn those views from those persons that are caring for you. So again, we as adults have to step up and begin to model the behaviors we want our young people to practice. If we're talking about tolerance you know, in terms of accepting all persons, well, we as adults have to model that same uh, level of mentality. And so the schools need to be a part of that discussion as well. So I think the discussion is one that needs to happen, not next week, not next month, you want to go home today just to have that conversation. The more we have open lines of communication regarding these pieces, the less people see types of ignorances that you are speaking of. Okay, start with. Yeah, I, we, we touched on this during our tape today, and thank you for your question. I'm sorry you're having to deal with that. It's nothing that a parent should ever have to deal with. Um, my belief is that the way, the way to make people be more caring is to make them more empathetic. And I'm a firm believer that if everyone can understand what it's like to walk in another's shoes, they might have a different perspective about how to treat that person, maybe what to say to that person. Um, I don't know if that has to be a part of, and, I, and I'm not sure what grade your, your children are in, so I apologize for that, but if, if they're in high school, you know, maybe that's a part of orientation. It's a part of a broader understanding of, you know, that there are different kids coming in with different backgrounds and you know they have the same goals and dreams and aspirations that you have living in a part of town that may not have so many open choice kids in it. So I, I truly believe that conversation, the development of empathy, will go a long, long way to uh, mitigating this issue. Thank you. Ms. Greenberg? I completely agree with what everybody has said. Sorry? Go ahead. Okay. I, I agree with what everybody has um, has said, and I just want to add a couple of things. The first is that we could help more, I think, if we were able to have more programs that included kids of, uh, from open choice more regularly. This is not up to us, unfortunately, but for example, if we had more transportation, then they could, it could integrate more into after-school programs and things like that and not feel quite so isolated. That's a sort of structural issue. Um, Secondly, of course, it is true that racism is everywhere in our society and other um, forms of discrimination. And we have to address it as a society, as families, as schools. That's absolutely true. But I want to underscore something that Jay said, which is that the schools, I think, have done a tremendous job of integrating children with special needs, uh, unified recess, unified arts, um, even into the classrooms. And that has made a tremendous difference with able-bodied children being able to understand and appreciate the gifts that other children bring. Thank you. Ms. Pollan? Well, there isn't that much more to add, but I do want to say thank you for trusting your children to the West Park Public Schools. I would say um, at the elementary school level where there's still recess, we should um, focus on making sure that all children are included in activities at recess and that they feel a part of the school community the way that they should, and that the PTO can probably do a better job reaching out to parents and families and making sure that they feel a part of the community the way that they should. And I also want to um, amplify Cheryl's comments around after school activities. I think when people play sports together, when they do music together, that's where friendships are really built. I've seen that with my children. I know you've probably seen that with your children. I'd really love to find a way to make that easier for our open choice students as well. Thank you. Um, our next uh, person to ask question. We are getting low on time. I want to thank everyone who has come, but we are going to take this question and one more. Um, but I want to thank WACTV for all that it's done to um, make this program possible, and um, all of you for coming and have lots more questions, but we're going to take two more. Good evening. I think we can all agree that this coming year's budget process is likely to be even more challenging than last year's. As board members, you will be called upon to make difficult cuts to programs with broad community support. What will your priorities be in evaluating potential cuts? If the superintendent were to identify the same potential cuts as he identified last year, what would you cut? Are there other areas not identified last year that you would investigate for further cuts? Thank you. 
Thank you very much. This question goes first to Ms. Ferguson. Thank you for your question. I think first it's important to, in looking at the budget, to look at each budget line item. Uh, budgets, the numbers that are put out there are not just put out there for any particular reason. They are made up by different programs, made up by different line items. So I think it's important to go through and really get a sense of what do those numbers mean? What are those programs about? I think it's quite easy to read about a program and say, okay, let's let it go, but what does that program do? How is it benefiting the children now? How may it benefit them five, 10 years from now as well? Some programs plant seeds that you reap the benefits down the road. So I think it's very important to have a qualitative mindset when looking at the budget. Yes, we need to be quantitative. Look at the numbers, I certainly understand that. But also qualitative, because those numbers mean something. And try to approach it from a fiscally responsible way, but also a way where we're looking short-term, long-term, but holistically, how can we continue to provide the excellent school system, uh, excellent education for our children? Thank you. Um, Mr. Sarkin. Yeah, I'll stick with the same mantra that I've been saying for the past five years. Let's look at how many kids it impacts, what is the cost, and how effective is the program. Um, you know, I don't hide. I, you can all go back and watch the video from last year. I was on the public record saying this, this, this. I don't hide from it. I don't take joy in it, but I have to stand up and be a grown-up and say, well, if we don't have the money, then we can't move forward with this. And, I, and it pains me to do that, but that's just how it is. Um, I'm hopeful that we don't have to face that. I'm hopeful that we do get our funding back in where it needs to be. And then even then, it'll probably still be way under where we were supposed to be getting because for the past 15 to 20 years, the state of Connecticut has been woefully underfunding uh, West Hartford relative to DCS. And that's a big part of the reason why we've had such unrelenting tax increases over the past eight, nine years. But I think you have to take into account the, as Warren said, the quality of it, but you also have to take into impact, um, take into account the impact and the breadth of the kids that it's hitting. So. Thank you, Ms. Greenberg. I think the tension is going to come a lot depending on how much we have to cut. Because just to be clear, even if we cut every single program on Superintendent Moore's list, that would cut nine million dollars, and the government's the governor's cut is twenty-four million dollars. So just to be clear. We could go back to half-day kindergarten, it wouldn't matter, we still wouldn't close it, the, debt, the, the gap. So part of it is we can't actually make those kinds of cuts. We have to look for some kind of other solution. Uh, otherwise, it's absolutely true. We tried to cut things that were the least, had the least impact on learning. I think we would work up from there. But as you say, the, the, it's not just the numbers of, of programs that impact small numbers of people, but also, are there other programs that could pick up if we got rid of certain programs? There are different ways to ask that question, but I think everybody's commitment has been to make the classrooms have feel the least impact possible on the one, whatever the cuts end up being. Thank you, Ms. Bond. Yes, I think you're absolutely right that the budget is going to continue to be um, the foremost uh, issue for the Board of Education in our town moving over the next couple of years. That's why it's so important to have the right people at the table to help make those decisions. Now, you asked for specifics, so I'm going to give you some. Um, there is not a chance I would vote for a budget that cuts full day kindergarten. Full day kindergarten is an absolutely essential program that we have in this town. It, it blows my mind that there are towns that don't have full day kindergarten, uh, and we cannot be one of those towns. We must have full day kindergarten. We know that it's better for families, and we know that it's better, most importantly, for children as far as their learning goes. Here's a program I might consider looking into. I would consider uh, restructuring some of the music programs, if need be. This is not something that's popular to say out loud. We do charge for sports in the high schools, but we do have phenomenal music programs that are provided at no extra cost. And I would consider restructuring through internships with the universities or potentially a pay to play system with waivers in place for families that can't afford it. Thank you, Mr. Levine. Great question, because it's really the one we should be answering. It's the one we should be answering to me. Um, the reason I'm running is because of this question. Because I feel like we went through a process this spring where you know, the majority party wants to, to scare everyone saying we're going to cut all non tenure teachers, we're going to get rid of full day kindergarten, and then they pull everything back and don't really commit anything and their taxes go up. And this is a product that uh, has been repeated time and time again for like the last 11 years. Like I mentioned earlier, the budget's gone up um, over $54 million in the last 11 years. We have over almost 300 additional support counselors, maintenance. Where's the money going is the question we should be asking. 
because I don't want to cut anything that is related to students either, but you know, you know what I'm running after when I get in there, if they, if they put me in, is I'm coming to the administration. Because I don't know, how can you sit there as a resident of this town and say, yeah, if you want a million dollars in 11 years, where is the money going? I mean, I don't think anyone can answer that except to say that there's a lot of fat out there. I know that there have been cuts that have been done in prior years, and I know that there have been cuts to administration. More needs to be done in that area. There's just a lot of money in this one place that we're not really accounting for, and we need to get better at looking at that, and I'll go for it. Thank you, Mr. And our final question. Um, thank you, and thank you for letting me ask the last question. Um, first of all, I know I'm guilty of forgetting that all of you folks are doing this on a volunteer basis. So Republican or Democrat, uh, it's pretty incredible your commitment to the town and your commitment to the school. So I just, I wanna keep that in mind because it's easy to be very divisive. My question, and I'm gonna ask for a 30 second clock for each of you in respect to everybody's time. Um, Lorna, your mom is here and your beautiful children are here. So I'm gonna start with you and we'll go down the line. In 30 seconds or less, why would your mom, what would your mom say why, why I should vote for you for our Board of Education? Thank you very much. I certainly wanted to recognize that my mother is here. She came from Massachusetts. Thank you so much, Mom. Why would my mother vote for me? Because since the time I was in her belly, she raised me and raised our siblings to know that education is important. Education is important. And we, in everyday tasks, learned about education, not just in the school, but also when at home, also when at church, also when in the community. That is something that was placed upon us as our foundation that I have now passed on to my daughters. So I am someone who tries to practice what I preach. I don't want to just impose rules and policies on others if I'm not going to practice them myself. So I have been bred in this way, and I want to be able to pass this on to others as well. And certainly hope that my mother would vote for me if she were a resident of West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, well, my, my mother is, is not among the living, but if she were here, I think she would say that my son has a real sense of duty to doing the right thing. I think that's been demonstrated my entire life. I think she knows full well that looking at the total portfolio of services that we have, you know, she knows that I wouldn't do anything to jeopardize any of those. The only thing that he would do bring in a sense of fiscal responsibility and sanity to make sure that everyone is going to get what they need and taxpayers are, aren't going to necessarily be on the hook for it. It's called bang for the buck. It's called a brutal efficiency. Thank you. Ms. Greenberg, my mother would say, vote for me because I am absolutely perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if pressed, I think she would say, uh, vote for Cheryl because She's really, she's got integrity, and she really cares about people, and she really works hard, and her heart is in the right place, and she's perfect. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> All right, Ms. Bowen. My mom has four children, and I'm her favorite, obviously. <laughs> I think, um, hi mom, she's watching on uh, YouTube, I think. I think my mom would say that my goal is to try to make the world a better place, and we can start right here in our own community of Western. First of all, I'd like to compliment Lorna for being put on the spot first with that question. If her mother was sitting right here, I don't know what I would do if my mom was sitting right there. I think I would. Um, and I'm sure she'll watch this later. But uh, I'm kind of like Cheryl, I, I come from a Jewish mother, so she'd probably say I'm perfect too. Um, far from it. But um, my mother raised me, if she was sitting here, and she, she would say that uh, Rob's a fair guy. Um, and, and Rob looks for the truth and everything. And, uh, looks for the, you know, the, the, the honest answer and, and, and is dogged in his pursuit um, and, really, and really getting to that result. So um, it's kind of how I live my life, it's how I do my work. I believe in being fair and being forthcoming and telling people the truth. Thank you very much and thank you for that final question. It was the same one I had on my list. So thank you. Um, and once again, thanks to WHC TV and to Juan Melanin for um, the assistance in letting us set this program up. The League of Women Voters is very happy to try all these different efforts, and we hope this will be viewed a number of times on uh, WHC TV's various ways. You can go to whctv.org and
and there are lots of options for how to view election 2017. So again, thank you all for coming. Thank you for those that came up to the microphone. We like to do that now and again, and for those of you who asked questions via the uh, cards. So again, thank you, and good night, and vote on November 7th.